remain standing and go to the Lord in a word of prayer to begin our service. Each of you praying in your heart and your own way for those things that are there and now lead us. Let's bow. Father in heaven, you who bless the earth with your love and goodness from the days of Abraham and Moses until this gathering of your church in prayer, you have formed a people in the image of your Son. Bless us with the gift of your kingdom in our midst. Cause us to see who we are as your children and accept the praise and the love and the service we bring to you. In this time of worship today, we come expectantly seeking things from your word, things from the prayers, things will speak to our hearts from the hymns that we sing and the sharing from our brother from the Gideon's camp and the great work that they are doing in spreading the word of God in areas which we'll never travel to. Bless us all that we might be a blessing to someone this week and so doing bring honor and glory and thanksgiving to you and to Christ Jesus our Lord. We thank you for the blessings and opportunities of this past week, and we love you for guiding and holding us through those rough times that we encountered. We welcome you into this place. Know our hearts and help us to draw ever closer to you by the things we experience here today. We ask all of these things in the name of Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Please, at this time, we'll share the reading of our Old Testament reading comes from the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 8. 1 Samuel, chapter 8, and there we read these words. When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as Israel's leaders. The name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second was Abijah, and they served at Beersheba. But his sons did not follow his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. And they said to him, You are old and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. But when they said, Give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told him, Listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not that they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king, as they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods. So they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for, the, for a king. And he said, this is what the king who will reign over you will claim as his rights. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses, and they will run in front of his chariots. Some he will assign to the commanders, and thousands of commanders of fifties, and others to plow his ground and reap his harvest. And still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants. Your male and female servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys he will take for his own use. He'll take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his slaves. When that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations with a king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. When Samuel heard all that the people said, he repeated it before the Lord. And the Lord answered, listen to them and give them a king. Then Samuel said to the Israelites, Everyone, go back to your own town. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our hymn of prayer this morning, as we remember those who are on our prayer list and those who were mentioned here this morning in need of prayer, is Take My Life and Let It Be, number 609 in your hymn.
Would you pray for us this morning? Father God, we come to you again this morning grateful to be in your house, Lord. Lord, last week we celebrated Memorial Day. Those who gave their lives to save our country. Today, we remember that day in infamy. To give us the freedom, Lord, to be here today. So many lives lost. But Lord, you and our military saved our country, Lord. We pray for our country. Lord, this morning we pray for those that are sick. Those that are not here with us this morning, whether they be sick or whether they just couldn't get here. Lord, we pray for them. We ask you to bring them back to us safe and healthy. Lord, this morning I pray for our military again. I pray for our firefighters, our police officers especially, our doctors and nurses. Lord, we pray for our country. Our country, as I've said before, Lord, is in dire distress. Please be with us, Lord. Guide us and direct us in the right direction. Forgive us of our many sins. The last thing we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the reading of the song.
For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us prepare our hearts to come before the Lord's table. Here in the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, we practice what is called open communion, and that is regardless of denominational affiliations, we welcome all to God's table who put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as it is His table and not ours to deny. Our communion hymn is number 426. Please stand as you're able and we'll sing the voice of Jesus calls His people. 426.
dear Father, we come to this your table and ask your blessing on this cup, symbol of your son's blood that you give on the cross of Calvary, following your plan of reconciliation, redemption, and forgiveness. We ask this blessing in your son's name. Peace of the Lord be always with you. Always with, with you. you. Let us stand and pass the peace of the Lord. What are you working on? The Lord is the home. The Lord is the home. Glad to be here. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I'm glad to be here. I know you. Yvonne and her Gideon Huston were about to order dinner from a food truck when Lorena, the owner, stopped her. I know you. I was in jail, and you gave me the word of God. Almost a year before, Yvonne was part of a Gideon Auxiliary Scripture Distribution Team. They went in and gave 300 women the word of God. Lorena's life changed when she received that little New Testament, and after two months gave her life to Christ. A few months later, her sentence was reduced, and Lorena was released with no explanation. Lorena said, I shouldn't be out. I was sentenced to 18 years. But she now attends church, works faithfully, and thankfully to award her business in order to provide for her children. Her husband's in rehab, uh, and Lorena prays that God will save his soul just as he saved hers. So how has your life changed? Our Vision 2020 goal to place 120 million scriptures last year didn't happen. In fact, we shut down from March through May of 2020. But God's ways are not our ways. And yet people need the Lord now more than they ever have. We've got Bible blitzes scheduled. International still gets requests. International even sanctions some special reach the responders and reach the educators efforts where it's feasible. And yet most of our distribution areas are still disrupted. Well, the world seeks a new normal. But God was never anxious about our world. And he actually gave our leadership uh, a future focus back in 2017 called One Vision. Philippians 1.27 says, Stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And it's just a return to our roots. See, the first Gideon is associated together for accountability and for service as Christ's witnesses for 10 years before we ever started placing Bibles. 
Gideons are professionals and businessmen from a variety of churches. So it's important that as Christians we strive together with our churches and with our families and with our peers toward God's one vision. Lest our differences detour others from the kingdom like we had to detour on the way to church today. <laughs> our objective is to lead others into a personal relationship with our Savior. We're a spiritual ministry and not a Bible society. Giving the word is a means to an end, maybe almost a requisite. But right now, being able to share personally is more important, perhaps, even than being able to just get the word out. We may be known for these hotel Bibles, but actually, more of our scriptures go on to you. And we provided 43 million of these life books for students to give to peers in school themselves. Church youth leaders uh, can obtain these just by ordering them on thelifebook.com. Jennifer blogged from New York, the book saved me at the hardest time in my life. I was failing, skipping school, drinking, and doing drugs. And I'd almost died when a friend of mine gave me that book and it changed my life. But even some of the hotels are becoming less welcoming of the word that new furniture that Hampton Inn is putting out has no drawers, so they don't have a place for us to hide the Bible. We'd like to go and check the Bibles in all those rooms ourselves. Can't right now, but the Hotel Roanoke and the Hospital Chaplain's Office have both requested scriptures from us. And their staff is going to replenish them. We prefer, prefer to do that ourselves, so we're there to give an answer. During the hotel check in Texas, Robert, the maintenance guy, handed a worn Bible to Keith, a Gideon, said, here you drop this. Well, Keith explained the Bible was marked up and it had been replaced. And so Robert asked for the old one. So they chatted a little bit, and Keith learned that Robert's mom had died when he was young, and his dad had been incarcerated all of Robert's life. But before Robert was 18, he'd almost died from a gunshot wound. And then again by a knife. And oh, by the way, he overdosed. So Robert knew he had to change if he was just going to stay alive. So Keith opened a personal worker's testament and inside the back page showed him God's plan for his salvation. And Robert was ready to receive the Lord as his personal Savior. Now, some of these scriptures that we place may never be opened, but then whole families, villages, and islands have come to the Lord through a single New Testament sometimes. God promises, my word shall not return to me for him. Mario's a grade school teacher in the Philippines. He also drives a tricycle taxi at night for extra income. And one night he noticed a brown object in the, on the roadside, and he pounced on that thinking it was a wallet looking for money, and it was a book. So he threw it in the side turn and went home. Cleaning the tricycle the next morning, he discovered that was a gift in New Testament in Tagalog. And this time he opened it, and he found the truth about how much God loves him and how Jesus had died on the cross to forgive his sins. And he's accepted the Lord and hopes to become a Gideon one day. Yeah, placed by the Gideons, but we don't place them by the side of the road. But God uses even the most perverse people to hand deliver his scriptures to those who are seeking them. Lydia Nubu grew up in a region of Uganda, hostile to Christianity. This is where they're burning churches, killing pastors, and beating Christians. One day, a Gideon gave her a New Testament, and initially she hid it in fear. But as time passed, she fell in love with that book and started to read it. And when she got to John 3.16, she prayed to Jesus for the first time, probably for anyone in her village. Now, seven of Lydia's family members are Christians. Her brother's the pastor of a local church. And she and her husband have joined the Gideons so that they can also distribute the good news of Jesus Christ. We extend your outreach now to all but about 23 countries. Sadly, Sweden and the UK have fallen to just outreach status. And with our membership down, manpower is actually becoming a greater problem for our ministry 
possibly than, than even the cost of the scriptures. So if our work seems important to you, please ask the Lord if he wants you to be a Gideon. Ask your wife to join your auxiliary, vice versa. Thank you, brothers and sisters, for supporting us over all these years. And we wouldn't even exist if it wasn't for the local church. Thank you, Pastor, for letting me come and share what God's been doing in his world through this ministry. Jesus Christ changes people's lives. It's just our job as Christians to introduce him. We need your help. Three ways. First, pray for us. Every time you see a Bible, think of the Gideons and pray for us. You can enroll as a friend at Gideons.org and get a current prayer list all the time. Second, we need members, church members, who believe the Bible and are sold out to Jesus. You can text the word IMPACT to 69922 right now if you're interested, and we'll follow up after the service. Third, we need funds for scriptures. Pastor already mentioned the cards. Thank you for the offerings we've already received, even today. And also, for those of you who have to shop, anybody? smile.amazon.com you can register the Gideons as your preferred charity and last quarter we got $6,391 from your shopping carts you know all this electronic junk is really cool when it works but I worked as a computer geek and I know that when there's no power and there's no connection it isn't worth anything sometimes the Bible just has to be there Leah, a 21-year-old Christian CNA at a North Dallas hospital, stopped for groceries before heading home. A man attacked her in the parking lot and started dragging her towards a nearby hotel. At the stairway, she saw four more guys at the top. Well, she said, I knew fear was from the devil. I think, and it came to her. Kings always place Bibles in hotel rooms. At the room, there was more men waiting. Leah made it to the bedside dresser, landed on top of her to struggle. There was a Bible in the drawer, just as she had prayed. Under that dresser, Leah began reading Psalm 59 out loud. Deliver me from my enemies, O oh my God. Protect me from them that rise up against me. And as she read, the men started arguing, take the book away from her. But the fear in their voices gave her new boldness, so she kept on reading louder almost shouting, deliver me from those who work evil and save me from bloodthirsty men. Suddenly, stillness. Light started coming in the window. Leah eased toward the door, still clutching that Bible thing, and dialed 911. Police discovered the fingerprints of 12 men in that room, along with duct tape, a tarp, and a shovel. Their plan was brutal. Legal. But God's plan shielded Leo with his word. And the Bible not been in that room, I definitely would have died that night, said Dan. Instead, she got off with only cuts and bruises. She gives God the glory and when she does get to heaven after meeting her Jesus in his perfect time. She wants to thank the Gideon for helping place the Bible in the room, but most of all, the church members who paid for it. So I'm here to say thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Praise the Thank you. 
The gospel reading this morning comes from the book of Mark, chapter 3, verses 20 through 35. After that presentation, it's great to turn in God's word again and to read there. Mark 3, 20 through 35. Then Jesus entered a house and again a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went out to take charge of him, for they said, He is out of his mind. And the teachers of the law came down from Jerusalem and said, He is possessed by Beelzebul, by the prince of demons. He is driving out demons. So Jesus called them over to him, and he began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, then that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. Truly, I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying he has an impure spirit. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived, standing outside. They sent someone in to call him. The crowd was sitting around him and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers? He asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Just before the message, let us pray. Father, as we approach your throne of grace this morning, we pray that you clear our hearts and minds for anything that the Holy Spirit would speak to us from the message that we've heard today through the reading of your holy word and through the words that will now come from my stumbling lips at times. We ask, Lord, that you would present them in our hearts and minds with clarity. Father, we ask that you speak now for your servants to listen. And all of God's children said, Amen. There was once a man who stated that his greatest fear is that someday he will be found out. What do you mean, a friend asked him. He said that they'll know I'm not who I say I am. That I'm not who I want them to think I am. That I'm not who I want to be. Beneath his fear, he knows that there are cracks in his house. He knows that a divided house cannot stand and a divided kingdom will crumble. And from the beginning of his ministry, as told by St. Mark, Jesus has been dealing with divided houses and divided kingdoms. He's cast out demons. He healed Peter's mother-in-law. He cleansed a leper. He caused a paralytic to walk. The houses and kingdoms of these people were divided. The strong man has invaded their homes. Their lives are not their own. That passage about not being able to enter a strong man's house without first tying him up, sometimes you don't have to tie anybody up. There was the story of the lady who had called the police and they showed up at her home. And when they got there, they saw a man cowering in the corner. A little old frail lady. He had broken into her home to steal from her. And the police went ahead and put the cuffs on him. And they said, what happened? What made you stop? And he said, well, she told me she had an axe and two thirty-eights. And they looked over at the old lady and she said, no, I just got my Bible and told him I was going to read Acts 238. <laughs> <laughs> the word of God is powerful than any more than any powerful than any two-edged sword. These houses and kingdoms of these people were very divided. And you know they've been separated from their community and everything that gave them security and identity, their outer conditions of illnesses, paralysis, possession to the point of inner conflict, the battle between health and disease, not just physically, but more important, spiritually. That battle has been around ever since Adam and Eve. They separated themselves from God, divided themselves. They hid amongst the trees of the garden. And it's seen in the scriptures this morning where Israel wants a king so it can be just like all the other nations. Forgetting that it has a unique call that is to be different from other nations. That is, it is through Israel, the people of God, that God will act for the benefit of all people. 
the division, the inner conflict is a reality of today's world in our lives. I was over having dinner with my parents Wednesday night and my stepfather had the news on and he'd been reading the paper throughout the day and he was just talking to me and said, I just don't know what's going on, I don't know what's happening in this world. And I know we said that, and my, I heard my parents say it, I've heard my grandparents say it before they passed away. But I told them, I said, you know, I've read the Bible cover to cover, and it doesn't get a whole lot better here. <laughs> you know, it, it, this is what we have to experience, but we have so much more now with social media, with uh, the news being available on your phone and on your tablets and on your radio. And if you can't get a radio signal, they have satellite radio. And so we hear about it more and more. But ever since Cain slew Abel, there's been murders going on. There's been robberies. There's been rapes. There's been killings. We're just hearing about it so much more. There's evil in the world, folks. And that's what we fight against. It's a divided house out there. A community divided becomes individualism, tribalism, prejudice, violence. Humanity is divided in all of those things on a global level. Faith divided is sin. We all know what it's like to live divided lives. You know those times when your outsides and your insides don't quite match up? That's what it means to be a house divided. You're one person at work. You're another person at home. You act one way with certain people and a different way with other people. Life gets divided into little bitty pieces. Behavior, belief, ethics. Everything's become situational in our lives. There's the work life, the family life, the prayer life, the personal life, the social life. Pretty soon we're left with a bunch of pieces like so many puzzle pieces. It seems that we're always trying to put those pieces back together too. That's why the crowd gathered around Jesus. That's why the religious authorities opposed Him. That's why the family tries to restrain Him each of them in their own way trying to put the pieces of their life back together, but it's just not working. Their life and their world are neither what they thought they would be or what Jesus knows they could be. One reality has fallen and a new one is ready to rise up. You know, one thing though, Jesus always stands before the image of unity. Wholeness. Seeking out all people for integration. He is the stronger one. He does for us what we can't do for ourselves. He puts our lives and our houses back in order. Jesus offers a different image of what our life can be and what it looks like. He does so by revealing all those dividing lines in our lives. that can't stand the crumbling of our own little kingdom our own little empires. Even when it is for our good, with the offer of new life and intended for wholeness, that's a hard place to be, folks. It means that one way or the other, something's coming that we don't like, and that is change. I just told somebody that at work this week. I said, you know, I, I don't like change. I like it when things are on a nice, even keel and they're working well. And sometimes the change later may be good or even better than the status quo you have now, but there's just something comforting about the way things are going now. And if it's not too bad, I can deal with this. I've learned how to deal with the way my life is going now. I don't like change. I don't think many people do. It can be frightening. Some of the people said in the Scriptures, he's gone out of his mind. The religious authorities accused him of allegiance to Beelzebub, to Satan, the ruler of demons. They project onto Jesus their own interior conflict and division. They're feeling it, so they're going to say, well, let's turn all the eyes on him. They have declared that which is holy, sacred, and beautiful to be unclean and dirty and bereft of God. Their accusations say a whole lot more about themselves than it does about God. Their accusations reveal the depth of the conflict and division they had in their own lives. They accuse him to avoid dealing with their own problems. It's hard to look at the division and inner conflict within our lives, though. The beginning of wholeness, however, is acknowledging our brokenness. 
anybody who's ever had any dealings at all with AA or NA or all of that, your first step is acknowledging what? I have a problem, bro. I have a problem. In our faith life, it's the same thing. When everything is broken apart and there's pieces laying there on the floor that is your so-called life, the first thing that you have to do is turn to God and say, I have a problem. I need a fix for this. Where is our own house divided? Where can we acknowledge? How and to what extent have we created conflict and division within our relationships? In what ways do we live fragmented lives just parceling out bits and pieces here and there at different times of the day, at different times of the week? Some of those things are anger and resentment and greed and insecurity and perfectionism and sorrow and loss, fear, envy, greed, guilt, loneliness. I could go on and on. And we'd be able to pick one out of there or maybe a couple that would apply to us. There's all sorts of forces, things, events, and sometimes even people by which our lives are broken and through which are separated from God, others, and ourself. But, and I always try to end my sermon on something positive, the great thing is, the great thing is, Christ is stronger than anything that fragments our lives. Amen. Amen. He binds the forces that divide us. He fights battles on our behalf. He fights battles for us. He's fighting battles for each of us right now that we don't know anything about. We don't even know we're in the midst of a war in some area of our life. And God has His work in His will in His way in His time is working on that for you. Fighting. He heals up the wounds that separate us. He refashions pieces into a whole new piece that will fit exactly where it needs to. I'm not a great fan of jigsaw puzzles. The funeral that I did yesterday, the daughter told me, she said, Dad loved to do jigsaw puzzles. She was so good at it. She said he might work on them for a while, but she said he would do them from start to finish. I said, I don't think I've ever finished one in my life. We <laughs> laughed over that. And when I was a kid, I would even get the scissors. If it was two or three pieces left, I would get scissors, and I would cut the pieces so they would fit. <laughs> they didn't look exactly right, but by gosh, I got them in those, those little holes. Christ makes sure everything fits just the way it's supposed to in your life and in mine. There's nothing about your life today or any of your family members, whoever you're here praying for today that has an issue going on, there's nothing about our lives that God cannot put back together by His love. Take that little bit of knowledge. If you didn't hear anything else I said today, take that little bit with you as you leave from this place today. Let us pray. Oh Lord, we thank you that you're near to those who are broken hearted and close at hand to those who are crushed in spirit. We thank you that your foolishness is wiser than the wisdom of humankind and your weakness is stronger than our strength. We pray for those who do not know your mercy and compassion that they might be drawn to you. We praise you, God, for your Son who poured out his life in service. Even when people did not understand him, he was always working things to, together for good, to put people's lives back together, to show them a better way. He was showing people that he had light and life to offer them. And his peace and joy, we pray, will become realities for those living in darkness. Forgive us, Lord, for our immaturity that makes us want to be receivers of His light without then going and being messengers of His grace. We must do that. May the testimony of our lives reflect the brightness of our Savior's love to those who need it. We thank You again for the Gideons and the great work that they perform. As with anyone in this past year, the pandemic has caused us to create new realities and new ways of doing things. And we ask, Father, that you would help them to survive and be a stronger organization as we move forward. And may we have a part in that. And to all of this we say, Lord, hear our prayers. God, we pray today for the healing of both people and situations near and far. 
Comfort those who have lost loved ones and send your abiding peace to them. We pray for the Kearney family whose service was held yesterday. We pray also for those who are homeless, hungry, lonely, widowed, orphaned. We fight on behalf of those who may seek justice and equality in their lives. For all of these are things that you've instructed us in your word that when we have helped in these areas, we're doing it as unto you. We pray for our leaders at all levels of government, both here and abroad. Speak to their hearts. Fill them with good things. We pray for our President Joe, our representatives in Congress, our Governor Ralph, and our state representatives. We pray for our Mayor Bradley here in the little town of Vinton and all of our town council members. We pray once again for our doctors, nurses, and caregivers, our law enforcement, EMTs, and firefighters. And we humbly ask that you would keep us all safe and healthy in the week ahead of us. And to this we say, Lord, hear our prayers. O oh God, we pray for your church on earth. Give us daily strength and courage to fight the foe. Help us to love and serve all people in a world that you have created. We remember today especially Terry, our general minister and president. We pray for Bill, our regional minister here in Virginia. We continue to lift up his son Tristan as he continues his cancer treatments. And we thank you for the positive reports that we've gotten recently. We lift up all of our deacons, deaconesses, and elders here at First Church and all the work they do in this place. We pray for those who are here and present and have heard your word go forth live today. We pray for those who will later listen by our YouTube channel. And Father, we're thinking especially of all those who were trying to get to church this morning but couldn't because their route was blocked. Father, make us appreciative of every opportunity we have to come into your house. Help those folks to spend some quiet time with you today. We pray for all of our members and friends of this ministry who carry forth your joyful word. And to this we say, Lord, hear our prayers. Lord, now as we close this service, we pray that you speak to each of us through your Holy Spirit. And as we sing a final hymn to your name, may hearts and lives be changed where needed and decisions of everlasting importance be made. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, for he is the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. If you have anything at all to share, share with your church family, please feel free to come forward as we sing. Or you may contact me after the service. Either way, we'll sing Where Across the Crowded Ways of Life. Number 665.
Christ has given us, His grace, His love, His compassion, and share that with others. Amen? I pray that you will do that this week, and I know you will when we go forth from this place. Again, Kirby, thank you for joining us. All those who were able to make it today, thank you for joining us. Be safe going home, and it may be an adventure, but you know, that's half the battle in life, is enjoying the adventure when things go awry. So I uh, hope you have a safe journey home. If you need me for any reason this week, please call me. My information is always there on the front of the bulletin. I'll get back with you as soon as I can. Uh, but I hope you have an amazing week this week. Let's respond now with our commissioning statement, which is there in our bulletin. I'll give the benediction, and then we'll respond to our homes to begin our service to God. In the power of the risen Lord, we now go forth into the world to fulfill our calling as the people of God, the body of Christ. May God go with you as you leave from this place and shape you into a vessel of his love. May his presence grow within you that you may bloom wherever you are planted and become a source of his love and grace to all those around you. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.